Cool. Thanks, everybody. Excited to uh, kick off our next uh, portfolio thesis interview. Uh, excited to have uh, Michael, uh, the founder uh, and CEO of uh, one of our portfolio companies called Finless Foods. I'm going to share a high level uh, thesis for what got us excited about the investment initially. And then uh, we're going to jump into uh, Michael's uh, thesis for why he created the company uh, and then dive in further about what they've been up to uh, since we originally invested. Um, and they're actually now in the process of, of closing their upcoming uh, growth round as well, which is exciting. So yeah, Michael, if I look back at when we first made the investment in Finless Foods, um, I think it was now roughly probably about four years ago or so. And the the backstory on our side was that uh, previously was the the I was the largest investor in Beyond Meat. Um, ended up you know two xing our entire fund. We had looked into a lot of companies uh, in the plant based uh, protein space. Uh, and my view at that point was that a lot of the core successes, you know, had kind of come. And what was going to be the next era of, you know, some of the breakout successes within the future of protein. And so we looked at going from plant-based to then thinking, what is the future of, of lab grown? I think we've now looked at probably close to 40 to 50 companies in the space now that, that lab grow um, all types of species and all of their kind of tangential companies in the industry. And what fascinated us about Finless Foods was our thesis was, A, if we're going to make some bets on the future of lab grown, let's go after the largest possible market opportunities in the space. Um, and so we've now met with you know companies doing chicken, cow, pig, tuna, salmon, lobster, shrimp, you name it. And tuna is a really interesting category in where it's placed within the overall market size of the industry of muscle that humans eat on earth. Um, and then on top of that, when you think about the the future commercialization um, of what does it look like to kind of have phase one, phase two, phase three um, of the future of lab grown, uh, which could look like hybrid, it could then become full lab grown. Um, and so that's really what, what really attracted us initially to uh, making our first investment in Finless. Uh, since then, we've gone on to make company investments in companies that are creating 3D structured uh, meat products. Uh, helping to do incubators, helping to do um, uh, growth factor investing to bring down the price. And so uh, you've also been tremendously uh, helpful as a general thesis development on the overall category. So it's been great working with you for the last few years as we've been investing in the overall space. Um, but walk, walk me through a little bit about your background um, of kind of what you were doing before Finless and then why you ultimately chose to create Finless Foods. And then with that, touch a little bit on the the market opportunity, because it is really a unique play compared to pretty much all other uh, muscle categories, I think, in the in the sector, um, let alone within seafood. Yeah, for sure. And also just want to say that we've loved working with BU. It's been a fantastic journey. And um, yeah, we, we've learned a lot through all throughout this. Um, so, you know, where did I come from? Um, I have backgrounds in biochemistry and molecular biology. I went to a school that focuses on agriculture, uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, which is like a three hour ride uh, west of Boston. And in studying agriculture, I saw a lot of the inefficiencies that are sort of inherent to uh, animal agriculture and saw that these are not just inefficiencies that are being pointed out by outside sources. Like these are inefficiencies that the industry itself sees and wants to change. And so I saw that if we wanted to actually get to the efficient agricultural production rates that we want on earth and actually uh, live a little bit, you know, in harmony with the environment, we want to change the way that meat is produced. And so I started looking into this technology of cell culture meat. Um, I first got into this idea because I read an article um, which went through how scientists created an alternative to horseshoe crab blood. And basically they did that using synthetic means. And so I thought, well, if you can uh, replace horseshoe crab blood, which is really important for pharma, quality control with synthetic biology, can't you do that for any animal product? And that's where Finless came from. It started off as a PhD project for me, um, but I very quickly was pulled out of that by some great investors over at Indie Bio, set me up as a company. They made a very convincing argument, which is, do you want to do this on your own in an academic lab that's really set on doing like heart muscle development? Or um, do you want to do this with a whole huge team, all of which are focused on your project? Um, so, you know, I chose the, the bigger team and, and, the, and the more likely project. Um, yeah, thanks. No, I have no regrets. Uh, it's been fantastic. Yeah, I know. Grandma's upset. I don't have a PhD. Other than that, everyone's very pleased. <laughs> um, but basically, you know, what is finless in this industry of subcultured meat? You know, we were the we were one of the first companies to found. We founded in 2017, 
And our idea was we saw a state of the art in, in bioprocess for animal cell culture production for pharma. And we said, well, what if we just took the equipment that's already out there that you can buy and hit all the same metrics that pharma hits? What kind of meat are we making and how much does it cost? The cost question was answered first, which is if you put all these things together and just do what pharma did, but with edible cells, um, you end up with meat that's a little bit under $10 a pound. Now, if you're trying to produce something like chicken or pork, that becomes pretty complicated. Chicken and pork typically wholesales for about a dollar a pound or less in the United States. So if you're making it for 10, you don't have a very viable business. However, um, there are some markets where that actually works great. Um, bluefin tuna being cheap among them. So bluefin, it is a, a small-ish market. It's almost $4 billion globally. Um, but what's great about bluefin tuna is that it is wholesaling typically for around $40 a pound. So if you can make it for 10, you have a massive margin there. And so that's why we want to start off with that. Um, from there, you can expand out into broadly not just bluefin tuna, but things like yellowfin, skipjack, big eye. These tuna all go for somewhere between 10 to $15 a pound. And so you actually have a pretty viable business doing that as well and playing around in that $42 billion market, which starts becoming something that's a little bit more interesting to a venture capitalist. From there, you can expand out into the $360 billion seafood market, um, which is great. And from there, you can even move into meat, you know, pork, chicken, and, and end up in these trillions of dollars um, markets. So um, Finless basically set out with this in mind. We think this is the best way to get the company up and running. That obviously there are some of these like bigger markets you can play in like pork and chicken. But we think the way to attack that is a company that's already set up, already has positive gross margins, positive EBITDA, and is actually running and then can put the deep R&D in to build those like very complicated pieces of equipment, hit you know cellular efficiencies that have never been hit before, even in an academic setting and blast off that way. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, T, you can correct me if I'm wrong. In the world of seafood, tuna is the largest mussel that humans eat, followed by uh, salmon, which is about half the, the market size. Um, and I think shrimp technically is larger, except nobody actually wants just the mussel of shrimp. They want the entire crustacean. Um, so if you're thinking of the actual mussel market uh, within seafood, tuna, I believe, was the largest of all of the, uh, the mussel categories. And so again, if you're looking to invest in something that has the ability to hit the highest future valuation, obviously going after where the biggest muscle is, is a, is a good choice. That's right. And also it's why people have put so much money into tuna farming. Many other varieties of seafood, shrimp included, salmon included, are currently farmed in really large quantities. Over 90% of salmon consumed globally is, is made in a farm. Tuna, not so much. All of it still is wild caught. Um, and that's not for lack of trying. People have dumped hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into tuna farming research, and it just hasn't been successful yet. It's complicated. It's a big animal. Um, it needs a lot of space. It's very finicky, and it has a long lifespan and also a long sexual life cycle. So if you're going to do research on salmon, figure out how to farm them, your experiment lasts six months. Six months in, your salmon can then reproduce. You can create more salmon. With tuna, that same time span is usually closer to four years long. And wow. so that means for every one salmon experiment you can do, you know, you're going to do like one eighth of a tuna experiment. So, you know, it just becomes very complicated. And so far, tuna farming today is still not economical. If you ever see something in the in the supermarket that says farmed, what it really is is ranched. What that means is that a young tuna was caught either on purpose or by accident, is brought in and then fattened up in captivity. They're not actually breeding them. And so we saw this as a huge market opportunity. The industry itself wants to figure out how to make more tuna, and it doesn't currently know how. Yeah. It was, it's also interesting is when you launched in 2017, we launched VU in 2018. So yeah, it might've been actually now closer to four to five, maybe even five years when we made our first investment. Um, is I remember looking at the the breakthroughs that basically allowed for now to even be possible for lab growing in. If I remember correctly, um, there was the world of in the past, there was a lot more controversy around uh, lab growing uh, and cloning cells. But then there was the the rise, I believe, of the Yagamanaka factors, where you could effectively now take a lot of different cells and choose the cell you want. And so a lot of companies have now had the proliferation of lab growing, whether it's muscle to eat or muscle for organs that were growing, um, really any kind of cell type. Um, but maybe share a little bit about what was the unlocking effectively of on uh, the technology side that said, okay, now it's actually going to be possible to not only lab grow, but we see a path where we could also lab grow specifically our proprietary cell line, but then also lab growing at scale that'll also be more and more economical. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like a lot of these breakthroughs around like high throughput sequencing have been really, really helpful, both on the DNA and the RNA side. 
Um, and beyond that, into specific factors, you know, there's been a ton more research in the past few decades on just what is muscle? How does it work? Um, and a lot of that research has been spurred on by these innovations in the tools that allow us to study animal cells, allow us to study DNA. It used to be this absolutely heroic thing to sequence the genome of even the simplest organism. Um, now you can like ship off a DNA sample and get it sequenced for you and sent back for like a few thousand dollars. It's just significantly easier. So that allows research like this to happen. We don't have to build up a massive team that's doing the sequencing of the genome, that's doing the characterization of the genome. That's figuring out what exact factors we would need to be able to look for in order to even do the research that we need to figure out if we even have muscle cells or not. All of this stuff has just been figured out. It hasn't been applied to tuna. You know, that was something that we needed to innovate on. Um, but the fact that all these tools now exist is really what allowed a company like us or our whole industry um, to flourish. And then you think about the, I guess, the evolution that Finless has gone through. Uh, since 2017, you know, high level, there's the world of of structured meat. There's also the world of unstructured meat and doing unstructured meat is a lot easier to do than structured. Um, and you also have the rise of kind of the, the hybrid world and then the pure lab grown. Walk us through a little bit about the, the history of, of Finless and also uh, kind of what's been accomplished so far uh, and kind of what's now come, coming up and over the next, you know, one to three years. So I think the general population, I think, is actually very unaware of actually where we are in terms of production capability to start going into higher production um, amounts of actual lab grown uh, muscles across different species. But Finless is one of the unique companies in the category that's been at this actually the longest and is actually probably has some of the biggest production capabilities um, going forward that uh, that you also have. So uh, share a little bit that evolution of, you know, from unstructured to structured, whether it's you know hybrid, all pure lab grown, and kind of where where we're going in twenty twenty three versus the next few years. Yeah, so we um, started off just basically figuring out like, hey, can we apply some of this research on animal cell isolation to tuna? And so at our first like you know few months, we were isolating cells and growing them out from things like carp, bass, uh, salmon, just to make sure that these protocols actually could be applied across species. From there, we were the first to develop bluefin tuna muscle cell lines uh, in the world. Um, we got the bluefin tuna genome sequenced, characterized. We built our own media, which is a feed that you give to the cells in order to make sure the cells grow. We removed animal components from that media so that we could actually grow the cells without any animal inputs, scaled the cells up uh, from flat surfaces where research happens to large-scale bioreactors, which is where production happens. And today we're sitting in our pilot facility in Emeryville, California. Um, it's still very small capacity. We just got the first few pieces of our thousand liter bioreactor delivered. Um, but you know, we're scaling up in there. And then like, what are we, you know, looking forward to? Like, what are we working on right now? Um, we just submitted for, well, one of the big things we actually had to accomplish was we had to work in consortium with other industry players as well as nonprofits um, and, and the government itself to create a regulatory system in the United States for cell cultured meats and seafood. So once that actually got up and running, um, we just uh, submitted our full regulatory dossier for FDA's. You know, we're hoping for a no questions letter at some point next year, if possible. And so that's been a big breakthrough for us. We're mostly just like getting our facility set up with all the proper certifications. So then when we start producing next year, we can actually begin selling right off the bat uh, in 2024. Um, so that's been very exciting. In the meanwhile, we're also like doing some process improvements. So standard in Pharma for animal cell production is something called single cell suspension, which means the cells are floating around on their own, um, each one floating in a, in a liquid medium. Um, that's very efficient because you can jam a ton of cells into a very small space, um, but there becomes some process problems when you do that. Cells that are adapted to float around on their own have a really hard time then turning into muscle tissue. And so what our industry has generally done is something called microcarrier production. So the cells are sitting on these little gel beads, these little edible beads and floating around that way. It's a lot less efficient, but it does mean you can turn into muscle. Um, we actually just developed an aggregate cell system. Um, so we don't actually have to use all the like uh, space eating up microcarriers and the cells are sort of more, more efficient in the same way that they kind of would be in single cell suspension. But since the cells are actually attached to each other and clumping together in like functional little tidbits, they can still transform into muscle tissue at a really reliable rate. And we developed a differentiation protocol that allows us to turn our cells with 99% efficiency into muscle cells, fat cells, and connective tissue. So this allows us to actually form what you're talking about, a fully cellular tissue product, and not just something that uses a few cells as a flavoring agent. 
Um, so it's really cool to combine those two processes together and not have to worry about like, well, we have one set of cells that we'll use for a hybrid product, one set of cells that we use for a fully cellular product. We just have one set of cells that can do anything that we want them to do. So it's been a really big year for us. That's amazing. And also fish itself, I think is unique in uh, how the actual final product is that people are used to compared to chicken or cow um, in the sense of when you're thinking about muscle versus fat. Um, and maybe yeah. share a little bit about, because when part of the um, mimicry that it kind of is going on is that you have actual muscle cells, but when you eat a, a, a fish that was born, uh, you have the downsides of that fish having potential plastics in it, some other toxins in it, um, but it lived a life. Uh, in this case, you're lab growing pure muscle cells, um, but in order to make it actually mimic what the actual flavoring would be of a traditional fish, um, there's the elements of certainly fat. I know that's something that you guys have been also working on on the innovation side, but it's, it's also different from the challenges of chicken and cow and, and pig uh, in terms of the makeup between muscle and fat. So share a little bit about uh, the, I guess, overall composite composition of what kind of the, the final product looks like uh, between now and in the future and kind of how that's different from uh, lab growing other types of uh, species. Yeah. So when we started off doing our prototypes, it was all Akami, which is kind of a low grade cut. It has very, very little fat content, um, but it was much simpler for us to produce. We had these like sort of dark, deep red Akami cuts. Now we're able to integrate fat and connective tissue to create striation. Those like lines that you typically see on sashimi. And so that's really taken our prototyping to the next level. The texture is significantly closer to what people are expecting out of fish. Um, and we can really tell people like, yeah, we're actually growing something that is the muscle tissue that you're looking for, the sashimi product that you're looking for. We're just growing it outside the body of the animal. And um, I think that's really been like a step function for us and sort of showing people the vision of what we're shooting for, you know, because even now that we're talking to like distributors, um, something that's exciting to them is that like, well, we can just make the highest value cuts and not worry about the lower value cuts. We don't have to make Akami at all. We can just make Otoro or Chutoro, depending on what the market is looking for, and index on that instead of having to deal with the fact that we're creating an entire fish and we have to sell all the parts, both high quality and low quality. Yeah, that is uh, that is a wonderful thing. And I guess from the, the last round that was raised to this round coming up now, um, you had a strategic that came in on the last round. We have another strategic coming in um, for, for this round. Um, we think about the, the strategic strategy of uh, selling this into the market, maybe share a little bit about what does that look like in terms of uh, production capability, as well as kind of going B to B first, B to C, um, the actual strategy, once you have production capabilities uh, at scale, what, what's the, the main way that they think this is going to get sold into the market? Yeah, so we're actually hoping to enter into the market um, and have it sold alongside other seafood. There are huge advantages to what we put out there, but food buyers are very traditional and don't want something right off the bat that's like everything different all at once. Um, so we are looking to go through typical food distribution. Having strategics is really valuable because they already have a lot of these connections and already can sort of vouch for us in markets where trust is actually super important for selling a product, especially a food product. So we're really happy to work with our strategics. So, you know, we've got um, a Japanese seafood company called Dainichi. They're, uh, they invested in us a few rounds ago and have been fantastic partners in terms of working with the Japanese regulatory system, as well as us now starting to establish a presence in Japan. Um, on top of that, we are also invested in by Hanwha Solutions, which is a 400 billion ARR Korean conglomerate. They've been really helpful because we are actually working with them to approach the Korean version of the FDA and actually build a regulatory system for cell cultured meats and seafood in Korea. Um, Korea is a really interesting market. It's not one that people think about uh, very often here in the U.S., um, but it's obviously a huge seafood buyer. It's a huge tastemaker. It's right next to Japan. And it also has a seafood culture of its own, which is really exciting to us. And we're learning a lot about one of the cool things also about working with this product is that like a lot of the other cell culture companies have to worry about creating something that looks the right way and then needs to be able to be cooked. And then uh, after it's cooked, it needs to look a different way, but that still has to be the correct way. Um, it's a very complicated set of chemical reactions and physical reactions sort of to make something transform that way using heat. Um, what's great about working with seafood is that the highest quality cuts are usually sort of served raw. And so mm -hmm. that helps us out a ton um, in terms of talking to the distributors, in terms of talking to these strategics, and in terms of actually approaching the market. How do you feel, I guess, in terms of the, both from Finless, I guess, and from an industry as a whole, 
evolving in the the hybrid world and then the pure lab grown world because there is the the rise of kind of these these hybrid companies and it'll be interesting i know from our side to certainly watch to see how they are adopted uh versus the pure lab grown i think the the verdict is still out but i guess any hunches you have right now both in how you guys are choosing to evolve um, as well as kind of how you think the industry is going to evolve and how will the, the overall market likely adopt it? Yeah, I think everybody is going to launch with a hybrid product like off the bat because it's just it's cheaper. It's simpler from a regulatory perspective. You don't get tripped up in any way, you know, like Upside Foods, the largest company in our industry. They're working on cell culture chicken. They've developed two separate processes, one of which is for a hybrid product, one of which is for a fully tissue engineered product. They got the tissue engineered product approved first. Um, and they started building facilities for the hybrid product because that's what they know how to do right now. And they kind of got stuck in a weird spot. They got hit a bit in the press for like basically serving a product on market that has nothing, not nothing to do, but isn't quite connected to their production facilities. Mm-hmm. Totally understand why they made the moves that they did. I think it makes a lot of sense, but it's better to avoid that. So I'm happy that we just have this one process that makes it significantly easier. The yeah. price point of fish in general really makes it a lot simpler for us to get to that point. So basically, I think hybrid products will be first. I do think that people selling hybrid products will be successful, as I think they already have been at the two places that are selling it so far, one in DC, one in SF. We have Barkren um, in SF. I do think that products that are like only like 5% animal cell probably won't be super successful. I don't see that being brutally different from the Impossible Burger. I think that when cells are leaned on for texture, that's when things will actually like be successful. So I think you do need a majority cellular product, even if it's a hybrid product to launch first um, in order to really like show consumers what the difference is. Because I just don't think consumers are going to buy this because it's technology. I don't think people are like, I'm excited by high tech stuff and that's what I want in my food. I think people want an actual difference in the food that they're eating. And so if your cells are just providing a flavor, I don't think that's very different from a lot of what's already on the market, including heme that's now sold by Impossible and Motif. I think it's really relying on cells for texture that will differentiate our industry and show success. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think ultimately it does come down to uh, to taste uh, over technology uh, in the end. Like it has to be a, a really great product. Um, that was actually one of the biggest reasons of why I chose to invest in Beyond Meat uh, over Impossible was, was ultimately uh, the ultimate just was a better tasting burger. And it also wasn't trying to trick you. It was another part of the branding thesis that Impossible was always trying to trick you to say, hey, do you think this is actually meat or not actual meat uh, versus Beyond Meat never was trying to trick you. Uh, it was just a delicious burger. Um, I think the hybrid is an interesting space because the question is like, well, part of it is meat and part of it is not. Um, and then it comes down to the question that you brought up, which is, well, how much of it is? Is it 5%, 10%, 20%? Um, what is the actual percent there uh, in the path to then doing uh, full lab grown? And it appears uh, you know, part of the limitations for that is one is the the co- cost of growth factor. The other one is just getting uh, capacity, uh, investing in the infrastructure to develop the capacity. I guess directionally, where do you think the, guess the industry needs the most help right now uh, to kind of allow for more um, large scale production of lab grown uh, products? Is it mainly on the production side? Is it mainly on bringing the cost down uh, like growth factor? Or where, where do you think the, the biggest need is right now across the board to kind of uh, create large scale commercialization? I think we really just need to prove to people that we can sell. Like, I think we do need a bit of capital into the industry. Um, But I think that once we have like regulatory approval, I do see this being significantly smoother. You know, us launching next year out of our pilot facility, um, I think that does prove out a few different things, just as like submitting our regulatory dossiers proves a few different things upside and uh, good meat getting the regulatory approval in the U.S. proves out a few different things. But yeah, I think part of what is holding up some companies is they're just waiting on regulatory approval. I think seeing more of those would help things out significantly. And then also, I mean, yeah, people being willing to do like project and equipment financing is a really big help. You know, us talking to equipment and project financiers has given us and our investors a ton of confidence because for us, like this is the last major venture round that we're raising past this point, we're really just going to be able to reproduce this one facility repeatedly, take in venture capital when we feel like taking in venture capital. Um, our industry, you know, a bit of a long time horizon. You know, we started like uh, five or six years ago. And so um, people are sort of, they want us to start selling. So I think you'll see over the course of the year, uh, you know, the next 12 months or so, as people start to sell, I think it'll be a whole different ballgame. Yep. No, that, uh, that makes sense. I guess in, ter- in terms of what you guys are now focusing on for the next 12 months is it largely is 
then on ramping up production and starting to to sell. Um, and I guess where where else are you guys uh, focusing the most on development over the next kind of twelve to twenty four months? Yep, twelve months. Uh, you will see um, our first few hires in Japan to begin working with the Japanese regulatory system to begin working with Japanese distributors. Um, we've also developed some plant based products that we're going to be actually launching. We did a test launch this year that went pretty well. We did positive gross margins, sold about 70K worth of product. Next year, we're going to do a full launch of that. And also, we hope to start working on it in Japan. You'll also see regulatory approval for us and actual move to market from our pilot facility. You'll see us break ground on our production facility after we close our Series C. I'm hoping that you'll start to see a paradigm shift. Like We've already changed the way that Washington talks about mm -hmm. seafood, which I'm very excited about. Um, we're being, you know, lumped in with NFI, uh, with, you know, wild caught as well as farmed fish, you know, because we've really liked to work with them very directly. We've been like, hey, this is just another solution to the problem that we all see. You know, let's work together to make sure that there's enough seafood for everybody to eat. Um, so, you know, that like buy-in has been created now in the industry. Now we just want to show consumers that actually the buy-in means something. Is the, uh, I remember from like maybe four years ago or so, the the phrase clean meat uh, came up. Um, and is it, has anything else kind of evolved around how uh, from, you know, from a general public uh, phrasing, it seems to probably get the most accepted. Obviously, lab grown is probably not most mainstream to probably use. I always call it lab grown, but um, clean meat obviously is not to make it negative towards the, uh, you know, the pure meat eaters from something that was uh, organically, I guess, well, um, was born, uh, you know, in that sense. But is there kind of a way that the market has now grown that you think they'll ultimately adopt it and how they refer to it yeah one guy was really pushing clean meat for a while and he like wrote a whole book but um we had kind of said from the beginning that there was just no chance of that catching on because there's no way the government's going to let us use it yeah um, it's a claim that we completely cannot substantiate in any way that's meaningful um you know we can talk about the lower bacterial count but then comes the question of what is clean it implies that other seafood is dirty which yep. is you know maybe true maybe not but it's definitely not uh, it's it's not neutral framing that all sides agree with, so it's just not going to yeah, happen. Yeah, well, well said. Not not neutral framing. Yeah. Yeah. Even even if you know th there's an argument for it, um, we ended up using what the government uses, and we've sort of pushed for that, and it's it's become more popular. So we're using cell cultured seafood. Other companies are using cultivated uh, meat. Yep. We have a bit of an issue with the term cultivated seafood because cultivated already means something, which is a variety of fish farming. So we don't have that option, but. Um, cell cultured and cultivated are the two words that the government uses, and that's what we've been using for a while. So, so cell be... cell cultured, and then in terms of the, you've had times now to engage with, uh, you know, the potential distributors when it comes to the value prop. I guess what's been resonating the most is it the fact that they have control over their supply? Is it the fact that you have, you know, reduction in the the issues of plastics and toxins? Is there any more of the fact that you can customize it for the client? Or is it on like the being able to get even better pricing? Where have you found to kind of be the the largest weight of their thought process or why they want to adopt this? There's a lot of reasons, but I think one of the most enticing for American buyers in particular is that right now, if you're a seafood company, you have to choose. You can choose to either buy an entire fish and process it yourself. This means you're going to get something that might be pretty fresh, but you're going to have to have the space to process a whole fish. And if it's a tuna, it's like over six feet long. You'd also need someone with the expertise to actually chop that thing up. That's not that intuitive. It's pretty complicated and it's a very specialized skill set. Or you can buy something that's pre chopped up for you in a saku block format, which is about this big, but it's not going to be fresh in America because our labor costs are so high. Um, even if we catch the tuna, which we oftentimes don't, it gets shipped across the Pacific to countries like Indonesia and Thailand for processing and then shipped back. So that means mm. that your fish has crossed the Pacific minimum twice by the time you get it. Um, so basically you're choosing either like fresh but crazy expensive and very complicated and very labor intensive or not fresh but simpler. And we can actually just make it so they don't have to choose. We can make something locally that is extremely fresh that they don't have to cut up at all. Um, we even have offered to like actually produce things in sashimi style slices. Chefs don't want that. They do want the soccer block format so they can cut it up the way that they want. But yeah, so I mean, like we've seen really good pickup from potential customers on that alone, not to mention the fact that we actually have a longer shelf life, partly because we're not shipping it across the Pacific again, but also because <laughs> we're producing it in a sterile environment. And so it has it's you have your younger cells that are starting off too, which is nice. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's a ton of advantages to doing it this way. It's it's just getting people a fresher product quicker for cheaper. And so people are always in on that kind of thing. The fact that we can also say it's something that's better for the environment and that it's something that's better for animals, that's just gravy on top. It's, it's just yep. a bonus.
Yeah, that's great. And then in terms of, uh, I guess, looking out over the next five to 10 years, where do you see Finless and the overall uh, industry on this? Because, you know, directionally, it looks like, you know, there's a, with all the different species that have kind of been funded now, they're all going to move into their production. They'll scale up. The future is, is it basically going to be that in the grocery aisles, you kind of have the you know, um, regular grown, uh, you know, animal food, you got the plant-based, you got the hybrid, you got the full lab, you know, cult, cell cultured uh, options, uh, basically by every single species type. And then where do you kind of go from there from an evolution of, of protein, I guess, for how humans are consuming food? How do you kind of see that evolution over the next five or 10 years? You have production growing, but any other kind of evolutions you think that are going to happen uh, in general, that Finless will be kind of part of that evolution uh, and everyone else kind of uh, part of that general uh, development curve that you think that everyone's going to go through? That's what we're hoping for. We're hoping to see mainstream adoption, which would mean putting us alongside all the other animal products. So you'd have, you know, in the in the, in the a grocery aisle, eventually you would see a wild caught tuna um, and you would see farm raised, probably salmon. Um, and then you would see, you know, Finless tuna, uh, cell cultured tuna to um and, you know, our first moves are going to be through food service. So we're going to be working with restaurants, which is how most Americans consume seafood in the first place. So it's a bigger market. It makes it easier for us on top of the higher margins that you end up with. Um, but eventually, yeah, we want to see mainstream adoption, which would mean um, getting right next to all these other products and allowing consumers to make the choice of what they want to eat um, and have all those choices arrayed out in front of them rather than having to be like relegated to some like vegan aisle the way that things have been in the past. Yep. I'm with you on that. Uh, and then uh, maybe final question. Uh I guess, advice that you give yourself, you know, looking back five years ago, um, anything that you kind of have learned over the last five years that you would have told your your younger self when you were creating Finless and how you've scaled it so far over the last five years, uh, mm. it could be useful for your your younger self, but also for other founders that are looking to, to create companies. Don't overcomplicate things. Um, I think I spent a lot of time like making very, very, very detailed um, investor materials, especially, but then also like internal materials you know, drawing out very complicated ways by which we could map out the internal organization, drawing out very complicated financial projections. All that stuff is going to change on like a monthly basis. And so what you need is to just not make yourself crazy. And you need to make something that's like very easy to iterate on very quickly. It needs to be something that you as a founder can iterate on. It can't be something that a designer, uh, only as a designer can iterate on or another member of your team. You have to be able to edit absolutely everything. If people want to make something outside of Google Sheets, you have to just say no. You know, I understand that like Excel is better. I understand that Google that uh you know PowerPoint is better. It doesn't matter. It's not faster, and you're going to have to change it too often. So yeah, that that's something that definitely has like uh, been pressed into my skull at this point after this many years of doing this. Yeah, no, I'm with it. No, it's it's been really exciting to see the journey of Finless over the last four to five years uh, from our, our side. Um, and it's great to see that you guys have really grown to being the category leader uh, in, in the space, certainly when it comes to, uh, to Tuna. And uh, excited for the upcoming round that you guys are doing. Um, so it sounds like you have, we have the new strategic coming in uh, for this round. And uh, the round, I guess, is now almost closed. So we got a little bit left uh, in the round that we're finishing up. But, uh, but yeah, congratulations on everything that you've done so far. It's been wonderful participating in, in a handful of the rounds so far uh, that Finless Foods has had. Uh, and excited to kind of continue to support you in the journey uh, ahead. Um, I guess, was there any other final um, thoughts or updates that you want to share uh, before we end? No, I think this was really good. Um, I think the last thing I would just say is like, we are like, it's an exciting stage of the company because we're like escaping venture capital. You know, we're doing like our last big venture round. After this, it's really just project and equipment financing here on out. Um, we're accelerating into this round by by raising a little bit right now. And it, it's uh, it's getting close to close. So I'm excited. I, I feel like things are working out. I feel like this is like the dream that we put in motion, like, like you know, five and a half years ago. And um, it's just wild to see it actually happen. Agreed. Well, you know, it's been that you've been a, an amazing leader for the company and really all, you know, from the story that you started from the very beginning to what you've built. And again, one of the great things I think about doing these type of uh, technological companies is that consumers get to engage with it in a very real way. Um, and so the byproduct of what you're creating, the future is you're going to a lot of restaurants, a lot of grocery stores in the future, um, people consuming on a mass scale, uh, a company that you created um, is pretty awesome. I remember that was one of the neat things about uh, Beyond Meat was I remember going to some grocery, sorry, to restaurants and the waiter 
telling my wife, who is a vegetarian, saying, oh, we have this uh, company called Beyond Meat, not knowing that they were talking to the largest investor in the company. Um, and the same thing is you're going to find yourself at more and more restaurants and grocery stores seeing Finless Foods on the menu uh, and in the grocery store. And uh, on a daily basis, uh, mass market consumers uh, engaging with a company that you created. Um, and it makes the world a better place. I think you know, ultimately it's one of those great ones where uh, do well by doing good. Um, and this is something that has a huge scalability potential um, on a global scale. And one that is, uh, I think, a natural evolution us as a human species where we're not killing things uh, to eat, but we can lab grow what we want, how we want, and uh, and you're making that future happen. So um, thank you so much for for creating Finless and excited to uh, to continue the journey with you. Thanks so much, Sky. I'm excited for you all to interact with this in the wild. I'm excited to get this out into the, to the public next year. And uh, thanks so much for supporting us through all this. It's been fantastic. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Bye.